Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Uh, today's session will be our concluding uh, discussion of Vijay Tendulkar's plays. Uh, this lecture will be uh, will precede the last lecture we had uh, discussion we had on Thursday on Girish Karnad's play Hayabadana. Let us conclude uh, our discussion of Vijay Tendulkar's play with a last play uh, called Kanyadan. Right? And Kanyadan has uh, around seven characters. Uh, you have the main characters, Gandhian socialist uh, family, uh, comprising uh, Nath Devalikar, who is a Gandhian socialist, his wife Seva, who is a feminist activist, uh, their daughter Jyoti, and their son Jay Prakash. There's also a Dalit writer um, and poet named Arun Athavle. Uh, uh, the Dalit character in the play and you have some of his other friends and um, Hamir Rao Kamle and Vaman Seth Nevre Gaunkar. Ekdam correct. I like the sound of my own voice. That is why I am in politics. Rahudya, don't bring your politics into this house. <laughs> <laughs> I've decided to get married. His name is Arun Athavle. But kya, if Jyoti was marrying an upper caste boy instead of a Dalit, it wouldn't have made me as happy. I'm just telling you frankly. Don't you think that's also a form of casteism? He's a writer. Actually, it's his poems that drew me to him. Seva, the old reformers didn't just talk about widow remarriage. They married widows themselves. Those were experiments, difficult experiments, but that didn't stop them. My daughter's life is not an experiment. After reading his autobiography, I felt I could do anything to make him happy. Just because he's Dalit. I don't care that he's a Dalit. We've fought untouchability our whole lives. But Jyoti's been raised a certain way, with certain values. You can't change that overnight. I am going to marry him. I will oppose this marriage. Seva, we are guilty of betraying these people for generations. This will be yet another betrayal. My decision is final. I'm with you. So this uh, rather intense play uh, comprises of two acts and each act uh, has two scenes. The play is largely set in uh, Nath Devalikar's house. Uh, if you look at the opening description of act one, it is set in his house which has um, uh, pictures of Mahatma Gandhi, Acharya Narendra Dev, Yusuf Mehrali and Sanya Guruji hanging on the walls. Right? So the entire play is really about the marriage between uh, the daughter of this Gandhian socialist uh, family, uh, Jyoti, and uh, Arun Athavle, the Dalit uh, writer and poet. And uh, the play is constantly struggling between uh, trying to reconcile 
the Gandhian socialist ideals of uh, Jyoti's parents with especially her father with uh, Arun uh, Athavle who is this very bitter uh, and alcoholic Dalit writer and poet a man who um, uh, marries Jyoti uh, agrees to marry her uh, and out of his own uh, love he says while Jyoti and her father Nath Devalikar wish to make uh, her marriage to Arun into some kind of a social experiment uh, an experiment with uh, that has to do with trying to transcend and overcome uh, social barriers caste especially uh, but of course this experiment by the end of the play uh, seems to fail when the marriage becomes violent and uh, but towards the end of the play Jyoti actually agrees to stick by her choice and um, stays on with Arun despite the violence. Uh, so let us look at the opening uh, scene of this first act which has all these pictures of these different uh, of Gandhi and other social activists uh, hanging on the wall. Uh, Nath Devlalikar is approaching 60 yet appears active is on the telephone. Jyoti is uh, going to turn 20 and Jayaprakash is his 23 year old son. Jyoti is doing some secretarial work for her father while Jayaprakash has dismantled a household appliance and engaged in repairing it. As the, the children are actually engaged in repairing something, fixing something, uh, Nath says, uh, Jyoti asks them, why do you always bother to get the phone fixed? Why do you bother to each ask each time? You know from experience that nobody answers properly. Besides, you leave it only when it is convenient for you. And in general, your bus does take you there. Right. So uh, let's look at the opening lines uh, that begins the first act with Nath shouting into the phone and he says, Hello, at what time does the bus leave for Asangao? Hello, the Asangao bus. Pune Asangao. Yes, yes, Pune Asangao. No bus service on that route? How can that be? Oh yes, of course there's a bus service. I'm telling you, I have taken it. Yes, your own bus. This is Nath Devlalika speaking. Member, State Legislative Councillor. Keep your member greetings for later. First, please take the trouble to inform me of the time of departure. What time? He puts the receiver down frustrated. The lines got cut. First, I couldn't get the number. When I got it, I couldn't hear anything. These people don't know a thing about their own bus service. And now, the lines got cut. A strange business altogether. Tells me the bus doesn't go there. Heaven knows who made him controller. So he's unable to get uh, the bus timings because his phone gets cut. And so Jyoti asks, why do you bother to ask each time? You know from experience that nobody answers properly. Besides, you leave only when it is convenient for you. And in general, your bus does not take you there. It does take you there. Nath, that's not the point. The point is that these people don't even have proper information about their own bus service. And since when has it been possible to get information by making phone calls, Jyoti asks. Nath, that's not the question. The controller must be fully informed about every single bus which departs from his terminal. After all, hasn't he been appointed for just this purpose? Jyoti, bhai, the way you talk, it's as if you have been specially appointed for the task of reminding all the people in the world of their duties. So this, of course, is uh, Nath takes on the a very typical Gandhian voice as someone who believes that everyone is, is, uh, is indispensable in this world in terms of the duties that they have to perform. Everybody has been designated a particular duty and responsibility in the world and it's their responsibility to actually perform it to their best. Nath, our Jayaprakash here, he has given us a, a new name, the repairers of the, of the world. But you two are still young. You won't be able to understand the visions we had of the future of this nation before independence and what we are forced to see today disgusting. It hurts. To Jyoti, have you cleaned my lime juice flask? Last time my shaving dress brush was left behind and oh yes, the towel. How can I do without it? It's not nice to be somebody's guest and keep asking for trifles. So uh, Nath embodies that generation of people who was born before independence, who uh, was, took part in the freedom struggle and had great visions for the future, but then has been disillusioned after independence after the fervor of the freedom struggle has realized that the nation is too rife with corruption to, uh, 
to flourish, right? to be able to conform to that ideal vision of um, a bright nation. Seva, on the other hand, is a woman who is extremely active in her uh, activism. She travels a lot on rallies, uh, demanding for uh, better lives for other uh, women, especially working class women. And uh, you can also see both husband and wife trying to struggle to actually make their marriage work in terms of uh, the fact that Nath is very proud of the fact that uh, he says we have a democracy in this house and we are proud of it. Democracy outside and dictatorship in the home, we don't know these two timing tricks. So he presents himself as somebody who is very liberal and uh, freedom giving and is not somebody who uh, controls his wife, while his wife is somebody who seems to be rather independent, traveling on her own, uh, going on these rallies for uh, demanding equal rights for women. And that is when Jyoti decides to confess to, the, to her parents that she has decided to get married to Aruna Thavle. And the parents are very curious initially to know who the boy is. And when they know that uh, he is uh, Dalit, uh, Seva and her son Jayaprakash, that is Jyoti's brother, are rather upset. They don't really want him, her to get married to a Dalit person. The father, on the other hand, is delighted. Initially, he th from the sound of the name Athavle, he thinks that, or he assumes that the boy is Brahmin, and he seems, uh, he looks like he's a little disappointed. But when he gets to know that uh, he is Dalit, the father is actually elated because he believes that this is now the opportunity for them to uh, transcend uh, caste barriers and to live it, to actually live the possibility of uh, going beyond caste. When, uh, when uh, un until now, uh, it has been, it's, it has really been their uh, their lives as activists their lives outside the home that has uh, seen them champion the cause of Dalits. But now here's a chance that Jayaprakash and his daughter get to actually live that their very ideals. And Jyoti tells them that uh, she first met Arun in the socialist study group. And uh, while Seva wants to know more about the boy and his parents, whether he has a comfortable job or not, whether he'll be able to financially support Jyoti or not. Nath is just happy that he is someone who is Dalit, right? He's only happy that the boy is Dalit. Jyoti says his parents live in a village. There's a village called Chiroli near Karhat. They have a bit of land there. And later we discover that Arun belongs to a family of manual scavengers and that they have over the generations gradually acquired a little bit of money. And Arun is able to send some money home uh, every month and but then they are not very well off right in fact they are uh, probably debt-ridden uh, agricultural family acquired some land and Jyoti also tells her parents that one of the reasons that she fell in love with him was because of his abilities to write poems and uh, and, and books and so he is she is drawn to his uh, aesthetic his rather radical revolutionary aesthetic Seva and Jai Prakash are not very happy with, the, with Jyoti's choice to marry someone simply on the basis of his writings. They think that it's a, it's a risk that uh, Jyoti is taking uh, to marry someone uh, whose social uh, background, whose behavior, whose habits may not match with theirs. Right? So they're rather concerned and skeptical of this possibility of marrying a uh, Dalit person. But Nath is insistent on allowing Jyoti to make her own independent decisions of her own life, um, he doesn't want to actually impose himself. In fact, he encourages her to marry him so that they can actually fight untouchability and caste. So for Seva, it still matters that a woman look for financial stability in a marriage. But uh, despite the fact that she herself was campaigning against untouchability with her husband, but she also looks for financial stability for her daughter. But Nath, in some sense, is a, is a lot more idealistic than his wife because he believes that they will be able to transcend the barriers of caste and um, make that itself a basis for a strong marriage. But in the second scene of Act 1, uh, Arun enters the house and he's introduced to Jyoti's family. And he's aged about 24, 25, and he's dark complexioned. It is, the stage directions say that it is a harsh face and yet it is good looking. And initially Jyoti and Arun are alone together. And uh, Arun's uh, reaction to the house is 
one of suffocation and fear uh, he says that he feels uncomfortable in jyoti's larger house and he says if you see my father's hut you'll understand 10 of us big and small lived in that 8 feet by 10 feet the heat of our bodies to warm us in winter no clothes on our back no food in our stomach but we felt very safe here these damn houses of the city people they like the bellies of sharks and crocodiles each one alone in them so he feels that he's been engulfed and swallowed by the large house so he doesn't feel comfortable living there or even being there which is why later on when nath offers to have his daughter and son-in-law live with him in the house or uh, they refuse and then later on arun says um as for me i feel safe on the street the bigger the crowds the safer i feel my heart shudders when walls of cement and concrete surround me i feel i must get up run get lost in the crowd later on arun also gives jyoti a description of his ancestors his forefathers arun wonders if jyoti feels uncomfortable in his presence he wonders if jyoti thinks that he is not worthy of marriage because of his social background he says our grandfathers and great grandfathers used to roam barefoot miles and miles in the heat in the rain day and night till the rags on their butt fell apart used to wander shouting johar my bap sir madam sweeper and their calls polluted the brahmins ears generation after generation their stomachs used to this used to the stale stinking bread they have begged our tongues always tasting the flesh of dead animals and with relish surely we can't fit into your unwrinkled tinopal world how can there be any give and take between our ways and your fragrant ghee spread wheat bread culture will you marry me and our eat stinking bread with spoiled dal in my father's hut without vomiting tell me jyoti can you shit every day in our slums village toilet like my mother can you beg quaking at every door for little gra- grass for our buffaloes come on tell me right? and jyoti covers her hand so arun is constantly trying to remind jyoti of what she is in for if she decides to get married to him the deprivation that she will face the poverty the stigma of being married to a dalit and so on and you thought of marrying me arun says our life is not the socialist service camp it is hell and i mean hell a hell named life so there's a clear disjuncture between uh socialism the ideals of socialism the way socialism is thought and intellectualized and the practice the actual uh, ground reality of being uh, dalit and living the oppressed and poor uh, and deprived life of a dalit sorry moods out happens often this is when jyoti starts crying and arun says at times a fire blazes i want to set fire to the whole world strangle throats rape and kill drink up the blood of the beast your high caste society and then i calm down like a tantric when he comes out of his trance like a corpse i live on i've made you suffer i'm sorry what am i but a troublemaker so arun is unable to reconcile his ideological relationship with upper caste people with the hatred that he feels for upper caste people and uh, his impulse to actually burn the world to uh, to destroy all upper caste people but on the same time he is also trying to unable to reconcile this impulse of his ideological hatred for upper caste people with his love for uh, a dominant caste woman named jyoti and his violence his violent responses to her so he gets into these uh, moods these these angry uh, enraged moods uh, but then uh, also feels extremely sorry uh, and contrite when he sees jyoti crying and this this constant recurs throughout the play where arun is this uh, heavy drinker he's he's an alcoholic and it is alcoholism that triggers a lot of his rage against dominant caste uh, people and his beatings uh, are in some sense uh, symbolic of his his uh, his desire for revenge against uh, the upper caste people who have uh, perpetrated uh such injustice towards his community and there's a constant refrain that arun comes up with throughout the play which is hasli re hasli ek bamani fasli which uh, translates as it, it's a jolly game caught a brahmin dame right so it's almost a, a rather sexist and casteist comment 
would suggest that Arun uh, feels that you know he chuckles and he's almost happy and uh, that he has managed to trap or seduce a Brahmin woman mm. and uh, despite the fact that he's Dalit right so it's it's almost brings out the double standards the the double sexual standards of the caste system where a lower caste man uh, cannot marry a, a, an upper caste woman uh, without being punished there's another incident uh, before uh, Jyoti's family appears. Just as Jay Prakash, Jyoti's brother, enters, he notices that uh, Jyoti has been crying. And Jyoti says, God knows what he must have thought. And Arun says, just this, that I beat you. Jyoti, in a soft, caressing voice, just look at the wife, Peter. Arun, why, why? Is it so difficult to beat you? Jyoti, I'm not one of those delicate, touch-me-not creatures. I belong to the Seva Dal tradition. Of course, referring to her mother's activism. And in a split of a second, Arun grabs her arm and twists it. And Jyoti moans in pain. She doesn't know how to react. She's confused and hurt. There's a lump in her throat and she tries to blow up upon the arm to reduce the pain. And Arun suddenly feels sorry and he doesn't know what's come over him. And he says, give me any punishment you like. So Arun is constantly oscillating between this violent rage and uh, self-pity and uh, and contrition and of course her mother and brother notice the uh, bruise on her arm seva is not convinced that she actually wants to get jyoti married to uh, arun she doesn't trust him she doesn't know uh, from his answers she asks him she interrogates him she asks him many questions about what he wants to do with his future arun just says i have a ba and uh, he doesn't know what he's going to do next. And Seva is not convinced that Arunas has, uh, will ever have a good job enough and enough money to be able to support her daughter. And that is when Arun tries to shock uh, Seva's middle class sensibilities, her um, desire for a uh, son-in-law with a stable job. When he says that uh, there's good money in brewing liquor, only you must know the technique. And Seva is shocked and silenced. And of course, Arun does this intentionally in order to shock and silent, silence Seva. And Arun says, it's a first class profession for two persons. The man bribes the police and the wife serves customers. People call her auntie. The more striking the auntie's looks, the, bri the brisker the trade. And so Seva is shocked with his boorish, unrefined behavior. Even Jyoti feels rather uncomfortable and awkward now that uh, Arun has said this to her mother. But when Nath enters, he embraces Arun and he wishes to accept him, to embrace him as a part of his own family. And there's a certain uh, paternalistic liberalism about uh, Nath's behavior that also makes Arun rather uncomfortable. So Nath's only intention is to embrace this man, to make him accept him as part of his family, to completely erase any social caste differences between them. She, he also praises him for his masculinity for his creative, for the creative stories that he writes, right? for his poems and so on. Nath says, I am really, really happy, Arun. Let us celebrate over a cup of tea. Well, nowadays, our socialists don't mind even liquor. But in this matter, I continue to be somewhat old-fashioned. A little worm called Gandhi ate into my brain in youth. Didn't he? Therefore, certain things slipped out of my life forever. Liquor is one. Fancy clothes is another, and something else. Celibacy would have been my lot, but a mishap occurred. Wings at him. That which they call a sweet mishap, just like it has happened to you. Right? So, of course, uh, Nath retains certain Gandhian principles like, uh, you know, um, renouncing uh, alcohol and not wearing foreign cloth. Of course, with the exception of celibacy, because he actually ends up marrying Seva. Then later he says, uh, Nath... Seva, until today, break the caste system was a mere slogan for us. I've att attended many inter-caste marriages and made speeches. But today, I have broken the caste barrier in the real sense. My home has become Indian in the real sense of the term. I'm happy today, very happy. I have no, no need to change my clothes today. Today, I have changed. I have become new. My friend, do you smoke? I don't. But we have cigarettes, if you like. Just the day before, yesterday, Anuji returned. 
don't know which international congress he had gone to attend he brought some packets of cigarettes so obviously nath is not a strict gandhian in the sense that he doesn't follow each and every gandhian principle he even allows uh, he even offers cigarettes to arun even though he doesn't smoke himself he also wants to present himself as somebody who's modern somebody who's changing with the times so he says there's nothing wrong in uh, smoking he even mentions the famous dancer uh, sonal mansingh who has been seen smoking cigars and then he also says a little bit more patronizingly later just think did it strike anyone that you that the people would stand up and flex your muscles and challenge the establishment as you are doing now but after he leaves seva complains about him saying that he is a man who uh, claimed to brew liquor for a profession right and so nath dismisses her saying that so what brewing liquor is a hard fact in our society seva says would you like to know what he said to me he wants to run a liquor den with his wife he said the children would be washing glasses and plates fetching pan for customers nath is a little shaken but then he controls himself and he says he must have been joking and he also believes he is still trying to support uh, arun at this point saying that uh, we need to be more conscious of of our own uh, western veneers of civilization and that is exactly what it's our civilizational pretensions our uh, our uh, western inflected refinement that has made us uh, judgmental and prejudiced towards people like arun who seem to have none of those trappings of western culture and refinement even jay prakash is not very encouraging of the marriage he feels that uh, arun will end up destroying his sister's life then later on nath says not only is he not a middle class man he is a dalit he has been brought up in the midst of poverty and hatred these people's psychological makeup is altogether different we must try to understand him and that is extremely difficult seva if you like i am ready to attend your your study circle on this subject but i will never accept him as my jyoti's husband never look seva nath says society cannot be transformed through words alone we have to act as catalysts in this transformation the old social reformers did not stop with making speeches and writing articles on widow remarriage many of them actually married widows why did they do it that was also an experiment a difficult experiment but they dared to risk it and so he 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 believes that his daughter's marriage to dalit will also be a difficult experiment which is not impossible right so it's only through marriage through intercaste marriage by accepting a dalit person as part of one's own family that one will actually slowly be able to create change and transformation seva says does it mean that my daughter's life is to be used for an experiment is that what you're saying you may have your your views i cannot accept them i am her mother jyoti later on when nath asks her for her objective assessment of um, arun she says that she doesn't really know him very well she only she's only read his poetry and his writings and that is one of the reasons why she fell in love with him and she says not only getting to know him but also getting to know about him and sometimes he shows such a different side that it strikes me i don't know him at all at times i feel i can trust him but the very next instant i am left miles behind him i ask myself this thing that i want to do is it the right thing i am afraid that my own mind assures me that he is not bad at heart by nature he is not vile he is complex human beings are complex it is possible that his complexity has been generated by his circumstances i must understand that complexity it is no use running away once i understand it i can dispel that complexity and even if i am not able to dispel it it would no longer have the power to scare me and this is jyoti's initial assessment or initial presupposition of arun that she believes that there is something potentially good in everyone including arun that like her father she believes that certain people certain characters have evil propensities but those evil aggressive violent propensities can be overlooked with time and will not have the power to uh, scare her to control her nath is still a little skeptical and he wonders if whether jyoti has done the right thing in saying yes to that man although he da- later on does encourage her to get married to him seva is very very again very much against the marriage and she doesn't want she wants her daughter to actually reconsider her decision nath encourages her saying all right then jyoti has made a decision for herself all discussion on this subject is closed 
Hereafter, all of us must forget our differences of opinion and go along with Jyoti. Whatever support she may need, we must give wholeheartedly. What do you think, Jay Prakash? Jay Prakash says, I will try. Nath says, not just try, you must support her. We have practiced democracy in the real sense in our home. This tradition should continue. Differences of opinion should be expressed, but the decision should be left to the individual, and the rest of us must provide support. Seva, even after knowing that such, such a decision will prove disastrous? Nath, yes, even then, whatever needs to be said should be said. After that, we shall accept the decision, knowing that it has been made with due consideration. Not by me, Seva says, it won't be. You run your democracy. To me, Jyoti's decision seems to be absolutely senseless. And as a mother, I cannot accept it. This is a home, not your party, where you can impose your discipline. Nath says, I am on Jyoti's side. It is perfectly natural that the boy should have rough edges. They are the product of the circumstances he has endured. In fact, it would be surprising if these peculiarities didn't exist. But just because he has them, it doesn't mean he's a bad fellow. He may not be a gentleman, but neither is he a scoundrel. As a human being, he has potential. He has intelligence, drive, and creativity. He has come so far despite his circumstances. This is not an easy matter. It is a result of his effort and dedication. You cannot imagine at what cost these people have made the little progress they have made. He is like unrefined gold. He needs to be melted and molded. This is the need of the hour. Who can perform this task if not girls like Jyoti? Of course it is difficult, but it needs to be done. Besides, she has given her word. Remember, it is we who are responsible for the age-old sufferings of these people. We have betrayed them for generations. We should feel guilty about this. And now if Jyoti breaks her word, if she wriggles out of her responsibilities, it would be a kind of treachery. It would amount to running away from the challenge. As a father, I would feel ashamed if my daughter were to run away. I am with you, Jyoti. What you are doing could be both wise and foolish. But one thing is certain, it upholds the norms of civilized humanity and therefore I stand by you. Right? So what Nath says is that he stands by his daughter's choice to take on the marriage as a social experiment, as a social challenge that would potentially transgress and ultimately dismantle the boundaries of caste. And he also is convinced that they are responsible. He as in his caste community feels guilty for the oppression that people like Arun have faced for generations. He still believes in the, the potential for good in Arun uh, and he thinks that everything else, all his rough edges, all the unrefinement that he sees in Arun may just be uh, you know, uh, something that could easily be uh, brushed aside because he, Arun, like all human beings, has the potential to be intelligent, to have the drive and creativity. So on one hand, he seems to acknowledge the oppressive circumstances under which Arun has come this far, he says, despite his constraints, for which upper caste people like him are responsible. So he feels that he needs to redeem what his people, his community has done to Arun's community by getting his daughter married to Arun. So it almost seems to be this redemptive act, this compensatory act for social injustice. But it becomes very clear soon after the marriage that Jyoti is no longer herself. She hardly visits her parents. She lives with Arun and that she is undergoing a lot of suffering and pain because of Arun's violent behavior. Nath still has faith in his daughter's decision and he hopes that Jyoti will make the marriage work at any cost. So he thinks that he is not a hypocrite. He thinks that he lives by the very principles that he preaches to others, that he will always be a responsible man. He will always look for the good in every human being. He will be able to overlook all the evil propensities that a human being has in order to be able to arrive at that uh, virtuous kernel, that core, that, that good core in every human being. So, Nath puts the onus of responsibility on Jyoti, that Jyoti will be responsible for her marriage and that even if she fails at the attempt, even if she ends up regretting her decision, right, he will support her. Right? He will support her for as long as Jyoti realizes or thinks that 
she is not meant to be married to Arun. But until then, the father does not intervene in the daughter's marriage. Right? So he, there's a strong emphasis on individual responsibility. That everyone has their own responsibility and to act in the way that they deem fit. Right? Nobody else can intervene. And of course, there's this added pressure out here because this marriage is, after all, a social experiment. So it has to work in order to confirm or corroborate uh, Nath's Gandhian socialist ideals. Even when uh, he sees Jyoti weeping, when he realizes that Jyoti is not happy in the marriage, he says, Jyoti, I'm going to say something entirely different now. Think about it. Talk to Arun and let us know your decision after that. There is no hurry. You can take your time. It is a good thing that, that we, as usual, are here, all here together. And don't think I was struck by this idea now, all of a sudden. For many days, I've been wanting to say it. In fact, last night, I had decided to tell all of you. That's why I returned from Bombay today. Jyoti, from now on, I want both of you to stay here. So he offers his house to Jyoti and her husband. Wait, wait, let me finish what I have to say. After that, everyone will be given the opportunity to voice his or her opinion. I will also tell you why I thought of it. Our Jyoti got married and Arun had expected to get a single room, at least temporarily. Sometimes our calculations go wrong. So we decided that until definite arrangements were made for other accommodation, Jyoti would stay with her parents, while Arun looked for a place. It is not possible to find a house in Pune unless you shell out a huge deposit. Nor is there any certainty as to when such a place would be found. I don't think it is right that after marriage a couple should stay apart for an indefinite length of time. Right? So he offers his house to Arun and Jyoti because Arun hasn't been able to find a single room flat. So we can accommodate him, he says. It's also symbolic we have seen we can actually accommodate a Dalit in our lives. But Jyoti is reluctant and refuses because she has abandoned him. He will not enter this house because I have left him. I'm not going back to him again. And Nath is very upset that she has decided to leave her husband. But for him, it's a big betrayal to his own idealistic expectations. Later on, Arun enters the house and he feels extremely sorry for having beaten Jyoti up. He starts crying, he even has a small pocket knife uh, with which he tries to actually uh, slit his wrists. But then Nath and Jai Prakash stop him from doing that. He's actually unable to uh, answer Seva's question. When Seva is indignant and asks Arun why he beats Jyoti up, he says, what am I but the son of scavengers? We don't know the non-violent ways of Brahmins like you. We drink and beat our wives. We make love to them. But the beating is what gets publicized. Early, he says, when have I claimed that I'm civilized and cultured like your people? From childhood, I have seen my father come home drunk every day and beat my mother half dead, seen her cry her heart out. Even now I hear the echoes of her broken sobs. No one was there to wipe her tears. My poor mother, she didn't have a father like Bhai, nor a mother like you. So Seva is not convinced with any of his responses to her question of why he beats Jyoti. None of Arun's responses are convincing because he seems to constantly reiterate the fact that he has lived an oppressed life. He has lived a life where his father has returned home drunk and beaten his wife up, has also made love to her, probably even forced himself on her. Right? And this is the life that he has seen. These are the, these, this is what marriage has meant to him. Marriage has been a very violent uh, transaction, an institution that rationalizes domestic abuse and violence. So he says that we also make love to our wives, but it's the beating that gets publicized. So Seva is unable to be convinced by any of his responses. Uh, the fact that historical injustice, structural oppression has been meted out to this community is no justification for uh, his uh, violent uh, behavior towards Jyoti. So on one hand, you have domestic abuse and violence, and on the other, you have the historical injustices perpetrated onto the Dalit community by dominant caste groups. And one cannot, in some sense, justify the other. Right? So even though they believe that, uh, there's a point when Nath believes that only people who have suffered, like Arun have, would know what suffering is. But here, clearly, that's not the case, right? Because he never hesitates to beat Jajoti up when he is drunken stupor. And Arun also puts the onus of responsibility on Jyoti. He says that 
she is the one who decided to marry me it's her choice i never forced her to stay in the marriage so it's it's the responsibility is hers to actually make the marriage work and not mine it shows she was actually fully aware of what she was going to get into and she continued to stay with me even though i beat her and so it's entirely her responsibility to make it work and nath actually seconds that statement of arun's and he actually encourages his daughter to make the marriage work to go back to him in uh, the second scene of the second act uh, nath is admiring and appreciating um, arun's autobiography right i mean he uh, he's unable to reconcile the fact that on one hand arun is able to uh, portray with great sensitivity the uh, oppressions of that his his community has suffered in his autobiographical novel and his poetry but on the other hand ends up being a rather violent an aggressive man uh, who has made uh, jyoti very unhappy right so he is unable to actually put these two together right so on one hand his reading of uh, arun's autobiographical novel wins his sympathy and uh, seva of course is dismissive of arun uh, he believes she believes that arun is a hypocrite that uh, Uh, he doesn't mean a word of what he says in his his novel and whatever he whatever sensitivity he may he may exhibit in his writings has been completely contradicted by his violent uh, behavior towards his wife right. nath is also extremely enraged when he gets to know that uh, jyoti who has been who's now pregnant has been uh, kicked and abused by uh, arun seva is determined to bring uh, her daughter back home but nath still wants to give it one more chance to see if the marriage can be made to work and in meanwhile nath has been asked to preside as a chairman over a, an award function right um arun's uh, autobiographical novel has been awarded the sahitya academy and he and along with some other writers and leaders have come there to request nath to preside to chair the award ceremony and seva of course is extremely indignant because he feels that uh, arun's work is just the work of a hypocrite somebody who uh, who is um sensitivity uh, towards suffering in his novel does not correspond with his actual behavior towards his wife jayaprakash brings the example of the uh, israelis who have been uh, in the news who have been attacking uh, palestinians and um uh, stopping their water and food supplies and bombing them and raising villages um and they don't seem to have learned from uh, their own uh, suffering at the hands of the nazis so this in some sense is a similar concern uh, in many of tendulkar's plays where and we also saw this in kashiram kotwal where the victim uh, the one who's marginalized uh, ends up becoming a lot more tyrannical than the forces that he opposes right that it's not as though someone who is marginalized who has been marginalized necessarily understands or empathizes with the suffering of others but nath does not agree with jayaprakash's assessment that yesterday's victim is today's victimizer he says it's all wrong prakash absolutely wrong it is madness to arrive at a perverse conclusion on the basis of a single example the ordinary citizens of israel will certainly raise an outcry against such atrocities you will see you are denying denying all of human culture and civilization that culture an entire civilization which man has evolved over the years so for for nath he believes that one has to in some sense be able to recognize or acknowledge the divine essence the 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 essence of goodness in every human being right irrespective of the violence that they are capable of uh, enacting he says that a single example it's perverse to judge an entire race or an entire country on the basis of a single example that he's unwilling to uh, work by exceptions judge an entire caste community by exceptions that if arun is somebody who has who is a violent unrefined boorish different in his ways it's only understandable it's only acceptable because he belongs to a community that has suffered historical wrong that they have suffered structural oppression so it's not right according to nath to judge arun on the basis of that so arun comes to invite nath 
to chair the meeting and he says that there are other writers like Hamir Rao Kamle or Vaman Sid Nevra Gaunkar, other Dalit writers like them, like him, who have been uh, spending money feeding other Dalit writers. Now, Nevra Gaunkar is a critic of Dalit literature who runs a hotel for Dalit writers. These gentlemen, he says, also have an association called the Progressive Dalit Literature Circle. And when he asks uh, Nath to chair the meeting, Nath initially refuses. And he says that, Arun says that obviously people will, will assume that both father-in-law and son-in-law do not see eye to eye, they do not agree on issues, that he regularly tortures Jyoti. And so he realizes, he in fact, he taunts Nath. He provokes him and taunts him as a way of making him come to chair the meeting. And uh, he says that, um, after all, you have spent your entire life uh, as a well-wisher of the Dalit community, that you wanted a well in every village for the Dalit. You launched a Satyagraha for that cause. It's almost like as though, you know, Nath symbolizes Gandhi himself. Uh, with the trumpet call of idealism, you got your daughter married to a Dalit. Therefore, they thought you would come, surely come to this discussion. Right? And so Nath is highly enraged after they leave because he realizes that his name has been printed in the invitation card and in the advertisement without his permission. So he is wondering whether he should actually overlook his daughter's misery and praise Arun's writing at the meeting. But then uh, he has no choice but to go. Right? In fact, he even says something rather casteist after Arun leaves. He says that this whole house stinks. And he tells his wife that the entire house has to be cleaned and purified. The hypocrisy in Nath comes out towards the end when he's unable to accept the fact that his daughter is miserable and suffering, but yet he's torn by his ideals and principles that he has to actually uh, end up praising Arun's writings, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he deeply resents him for uh, ill-treating his daughter. And that is, that is what, uh, in some sense, uh, creates a rift between father and daughter. When Jyoti uh, listens to her father speak at the, at the meeting, she realizes that her father is also a hypocrite, somebody who has not lived by his principles. Nath says, when Seva says, you were full of praise for Arun's book. And he says, I was a fool then, an ignorant fool, not anymore. This book is not a novel, it is an autobiography. It depicts a real person's life. And it is the responsibility of the author to stick to the truth. But the book has not even an ounce of truth in it. It is a hoax. It is a crafty, sanctimonious, artistic hoax. Nothing is real in that book. Neither the man nor his values. At best, it is good fiction and therefore, Seva, most dangerous. Because this kind of hypocrisy marks a rank opportunist. The devil lurks within that opportunist. That book is no autobiography. It is pulp fiction based on half truth. So the very genre of the book, which is neither autobiography nor novel, is uh, something that seems to blur the very line between reality and fiction. But precisely because it is reality being couched in the form of fictional claims, fictional truths, that it becomes dangerous for Nath. That it is something which does not correspond to reality. That Arun, on the one hand, if he's capable of great sensitivity in the way he depicts the historical injustices, perpetrated on his community. On the other hand, he does not live by that sensitivity when it comes to his own personal married life with his wife. And then Nath is transformed by the end of that act where he says that I did not pay any attention. Initially, I thought it was Jyoti's choice and responsibility to marry a Dalit man. He thought it would be a successful social experiment to uproot caste. But then he realizes that he has made a mistake by pushing his daughter into a what he calls a sea of misery. And she, she also feels up, he feels, he regrets the fact that his children have actually adopted his own values, right? He says, she's, he said, Nath says, she was guided by her father's humanism and liberalism. And he even tells his son, Jay Prakash, do me a favor, reject your father. Learn to see through his naivete and idiocy. Don't ever rely on his wisdom. If you do, you too will ruin yourself. So the failure of his daughter's marriage, the failure of that social experiment, is of the failure of Nath's own Gandhian and socialist ideals. Right? His own humanism and liberalism have proved to be a mere hoax. So he's completely dis disillusioned and, and as he's dissolved of all his idealism by the end of the play. We, we see an elaboration of the sense of disillusionment towards the end of the second act in the conversation between the father and the daughter. Jyoti says, 
I heard it all in your speech, hired for the occasion, in your false, deceitful speech. I know what you really wanted to say. I heard what you were unable to say. Whenever your eyes fell on him, they dripped poison. After the meeting, he tried to meet you, see you. And I saw how you ignored the man you hold in such high esteem. Bhai, after today, you cannot fool me. In your heart, there's just hatred for Arun and nothing else. Nath, in a softer tone, trying to explain. You are making a mistake. I don't hate Arun. I hate only those tendencies. Those tendencies. Jyoti. Tendencies. I grew up listening to such talk day in and day out. Hatred not for the man, but for his tendencies. No man is fundamentally evil. He is good. He has certain propensities towards evil. They must be transformed, completely uprooted and destroyed. And then the earth will become heaven. It is essential to awaken the God slumbering within man. All false vicious claptrap. The truth is, you knew very well that man and his inherent nature are never really two different things. Both are one and inseparable, and either you accept it in totality, or you reject it if you can. Very often you don't have a choice. Putting man's beastliness to sleep and awakening the Godhead within it is an absurd notion. You made me waste 20 years of my life before I could discover this. I had to learn it on the strength of my own experience. I had to meet a man named Arun Atavle. Arun gave me what you had withheld from me. I must acknowledge my debt to him. So he realized now that, jo jo that Jyoti is disillusioned and betrayed by the idealistic social, the Gandhian socialist ideals that she grew up on, which seem to claim or suggest that one has to accept a man for what he is and uh, recognize only the, the Godhead, the, the divine essence in a man, and completely uh, overlook his evil propensities. But then in, in, in doing so, one is actually being rather insensitive to uh, the impact, uh, the effect that historical uh, injustices have on a man or a human being's uh, upbringing and his outlook to life, and his values. So it's not historically sensitive to uh, larger wrongs, social wrongs, structural forms of oppression. Later on, Jyoti says that, come and watch Arun at night when he staggers home roaring drunk. If you have the guts, there's a savage beast in his eyes, his lips, his face, in every single limb. And bestiality is something which cannot be separated from him. In the beginning, like an idiot, I used to search for that Arun who is above and beyond this beastliness. I used to call out to him, take him in my arms. Hard experience taught me I would always fail. Arun is both the beast and the lover. Arun is the, lo is the demon and also the poet. Both are bound together, one within the other. They are one. So closely bound that at, at times it is not possible to distinguish the demon from the poet. Filthy cursing is a part of his frenzied love. A sudden shower of hard, ardent kisses accompanies the rain of blows. After going through these miseries, if the broken body needs some, finds some rest and wakes to engage itself in the routine, then a few lines come to mind, come to hand. Lines steeped in feeling, fragments of poetry filled with the throb of pain. And a fresh start is made. Love springs once again, even while the ear is defiled by plot space and vile, to defraud and trick well-wishers. All these things are done by the same person, at the same time. Tell me, where is that beast I should drag out and destroy? Where is it God I should arouse from his, from his sleep? Tell me, Arun is made of all these things bound together and I have to accept him as he is because I cannot reject him. Right? So she has decided to accept Arun for what he is. That this Gandhian philosophy, idealism that only that decides to separate or distinguish the good from the evil and privilege the good over the evil is not possible. Right? That he, she has to accept Arun as the very product of the structural forms of oppression that he has suffered, as his family, his community has suffered. That you cannot actually separate the supposedly the violence in Arun from the tenderness, right? The intimacy from the from the ideological hatred that he seems to feel for people who are privileged and upper caste. One needs to accept all of it. And this is a choice that she makes and for which she takes responsibility. Later on, Jyoti says, I have to stop thinking and learn to live. I think a lot, suffer a lot. Not from the blows, but from my own thoughts. I can't bear them much longer. Forgive me, bhai. I said things I shouldn't have, but I couldn't help it. I was deeply offended by your hypocrisy. I thought, why did this man have to inject and drug us every day with truth and goodness? 
and if he can't get away from it at will, what right did he have to close all our options? I haven't been able to forget an image I saw years ago on my way to school. A man opened the lids of two baskets slung upon the pole he carried on his shoulder. And from them, two shaking, swaying, staggering creatures slipped out, human in appearance, their wrinkled skin covering twisted bodies. Someone said these people kidnap little children, break their limbs and make them cripples. Bhai, forgive me for my words, but you have made us and she cannot go on. And then she refuses to come back home to him. And she says finally that she will refuse to, she refuses to leave her husband. And she says, I have my husband. I'm not a widow. Even if I become one, I shan't knock at your door. I am not Jyoti Yadunath Devlalikar now. I am Jyoti Arun Athavle, a scavenger. I don't say Harijan. I despise the term. I am an untouchable, a scavenger. I am one of them. Don't touch me. Fly from my shadows. Otherwise, my fire will scorch your uncomfortable, your, your comfortable values. Right? So, Jyoti completely tries to embrace her new identity as, a, as, a, as an untouchable, as a scavenger. And as someone who symbolizes the, uh, the very um, undoing of uh, her father's Gandhian principle, that she is no longer impressed by her, by her father's values. She realizes that it's only her, her own experience of marriage to a Dalit that has taught her that she can no longer live by her father's principles. Her father has the privilege uh, the choice of uh, not having to realize his ideals, his principles in the everyday. Right? But his daughter has made the choice of living with a man who is at once tender, at once sensitive. From on the other hand, is also a product of the historical injustices uh, meted to against Dalits. Let us uh, conclude our discussion of Vijay Tendulkar's plays by looking at the slides. This is just a summary of the four plays that we've discussed so far. We began with Silence, the Court is in Session, which describes the patriarchal enslavement of women within the space of a court and a mock trial. The court itself symbolizes the space of patriarchy where Ms. Binare is trapped twice, uh, towards the end of the second act and then towards the end of the third act. What begins as a mock trial can no longer by, be distinguished from the actual play within the play by the end. Benare betrays her own crime, as, uh, in quotes, inverted quotes, her own crime of bearing an illegitimate child outside marriage and falling in love with a married man named Professor Damle, who never appears on stage despite the fact that he's also responsible for the illegitimate child. Miss Benare's songs and poems suggest her own sense of isolation and loneliness. She's accused of being sexually promiscuous and of a disreputable character by the other characters in the play. The male characters of the play, including Sukhatme and Pongshe, wish to have a relationship with a bold woman, and this can be seen in the way they actually analyze, dissect her life with great salacious interest and end up gossiping about her and creating these uh, stories about her uh, alleged affair with the professor. But eventually they end up distancing themselves from her because she does not conform to the ideal of a chaste woman or wife. Right? So every man in some sense bears a secret desire to have a, a relationship with a woman like her because she's so accessible or so she seems to be uh, very accessible but on the other hand distance themselves from her because she is uh, not she does not conform to the ideal of a chaste woman or wife. Ms. Benari is charged with infanticide even before her crime has been determined she is condemned to be punished and shamed because she has desecrated the institution of marriage and motherhood by having a child outside wedlock. Her monologue uh, towards the end of the second act is hardly a defense against the charges. It is more a conversation with herself about the significance of life and her own desire to live, to be a reputed school teacher. Because if you remember, it's her initially she uh, comes up, uh, she tells the audience that her reputation has been tarnished. Her reputation as a school teacher has been tarnished because of, an, of her affair with an older married man and because she has also conceived a child with him. She occasionally ridicules the other characters throughout the play who are all struggling and insecure actors. But she is progressively silenced and her voice is usurped by the characters 
taken on assumed by other characters including Mrs. Kashigar who is also a participant and beneficiary of patriarchy even though she is often humiliated and silenced by her own husband. Even Samant who is initially an innocent villager and, watch, and watcher and bystander gets involved in the conspiratorial machinations of patriarchy to trap and victimize Ms. Benare for her unconventional life. Ms. Benare claims Professor Damle loved her for her body while she worshipped his inter intellect. The other characters like Pong and Sukhatme accuse her of trying to seduce him when she wanted a man to love and be a father to her child. Karnik also believes that she had an affair with her uncle when she was young. Ms. Benari has a very ambiguous relationship to her body and this comes through in her long monologue towards the end which is a vehicle for movement and freedom because you also see how Ms. Benari is on the one hand extremely lively and vivacious and loves her life and values life but on the other also uh, nurses uh, conceals a, a deep sense of hurt uh, towards the uh, other characters who have maligned and stigmatized her. Right? But she's also condemned to be stigmatized by others. So on one hand, if the body is a symbol for movement and freedom, on the other hand, the female body is also stigmatized by others as a bearer of uh, either uh, social, uh, sexual disrepute and uh, sexual stigma. In a friend's story, uh, the play is narrated by an unconventional man named Bapu, who recounts his friendship with Sumitra. The play switches between past and present as Bapu steps in and out of his character as the, the narrator and the character in the play. Bapu is a sensitive and gentle man who is secretly in love with Sumitra but withdraws when he learns that she is a lesbian. His roommate Pandey is infatuated with Sumitra when she see, he sees her playing a man in a play he organized for the college where they study. Sumitra is obsessed with Nama, a young woman who uh, she acts in a play with, but Nama also has a boyfriend named Manya Dalvi, who is a conventional and aggressive macho man. Dalvi resents and violently hates Subhitra for being lesbian and there is a violent altercation between them when he discovers her with Nama in Bapu's room. When Sumitra takes advantage of Bapu's freedom and forges his handwriting and signature to write a love letter to Nama and, and warns Dalvi to stay away from Nama, Dalvi assaults Bapu. So Dalvi assumes that Bapu has written that letter to Nama and that Bapu is in love with Nama when it's actually Sumitra who forges Bapu's handwriting to write a letter and posts the letter from Bapu's locality to Nama. Sumitra shows no response for what she has gotten Bapu into. Bapu remains gentle and caring friend who tries to convince Sumitra to give up her obsession with Nama. But Sumitra is a narcissistic character who does not show her vulnerability to anyone and needs Nama to validate herself. She remains an isolated character who tries to end in a largely self-imposed isolation, who tries to end her life twice in the play when her family rejects her and she discovers she's lesbian. Nama stops seeing her and it becomes clear that there's no difference between Sumitra and Dalvi's love for her both of whom are possessive and indifferent to her own feelings. Bapu ends up feeling used by both Sumitra and Dalvi, who want his room for their rendezvous with Nama. Nama confides in Bapu, telling him of her plans to get married to another man in Calcutta. Bapu feels bad for Sumitra and tells her, but she betrays his trust and goes in search of Nama, but in vain. The latter gets married and Sumitra is completely lost. Pandey withdraws and this withdraws from his love for Nama and he joins Second World War as a soldier. When he returns, he meets Dalvi and Bapu some years later and the three of them visit a bar where they see Sumitra drunk performing before a group of officers. This is the only time in the play when Sumitra exposes her vulnerability and considers Bapu the mother she never had. She misses their friendship but by the end of the play, she successfully ends up committing suicide. In Ghashiram Kotwal, the play takes the form of a choral song and dance performance that depicts the hollowness of political power. The play is a political satire set during the 18th century and describes the court life of Nana Fadnavis, one of the prominent ministers of the Peshwa of Pune. It was first performed in 1972. Ghashiram is a Brahmin from Kanauj who is humiliated and beaten up by the Pune Brahmins for winning the Nana's favour. He is made Kotwal or constable of Pune in exchange for his daughter Gauri, who is to satisfy Nana's lust. Ghashram takes his revenge by turning Pune into a moral police state, where no one has any freedom to do anything without his permission. In his attempt to fight the powers of Brahminism, he becomes more tyrannical than the forces he opposes. 
the chorus of men who form props and characters in the play function to expose the irony of religious piety and the violence and greed that fuels political ambition and power. We see this in that scene when uh, the Nana tries to seduce Gauri before uh, the idol of Ganesha and when uh, Gauri uh, uh, reminds him that they are standing in front of the Lord um, out of this sheer discomfort. Uh, he says uh, mockingly that do you think that idol of Ganesha cares or, 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 or can, can do anything about, about, about me and my power. Gashram believes he is all powerful but realizes his power is merely derivative of the Nana who is himself a deputy of the Peshwa who never appears on stage. The play is about the deputation of power and how people can never recognize the true source of power. Right? So the whole play is really about deputation, how power is constantly deputed to others, delegated to others, and by the end of which uh, it becomes impossible to actually acknowledge the true, the absolute source of power. Um, because Ghashram also thinks or imagines that he is absolutely powerful when he is not. When Ghashram discovers his daughter is missing and probably dead, he is unable to challenge the Nana's authority. The Nana marries another young girl, even though he has several wives. Finally, Ghashram is beaten up and killed by the mobs for his tyranny, while he realizes his guilt for having sacrificed his own daughter for his political ambitions. In the last play, Kanyadan, uh, it describes the marriage between Jyoti, the daughter of an upper caste Gandhian couple, Nath Devlalikar, and Seva, a feminist activist, and Arun Athavle, a young Dalit poet and, poet and writer, who belongs to a family of manual scavengers. The marriage is initially intended by the father and daughter to be an experiment to transcend and dismantle caste differences. Seva and her son Jayaprakash are against the marriage because of Arun's unrefined and violent ways. He beats Jyoti whenever he is drunk and because he is unemployed. There is a clear social class difference between Jyoti and Arun, which by the end of the play has not been transcended. Jyoti is unable to renounce her choice to remain married to Arun, partly because she feels responsible and hopeful that Arun will change and partly because she has internalized her father's injunctions to never give up on the social project of reformation and forgiveness. A Christian vision, as it were, of seeing only the potential good in all people and transforming their evil propensities. She realizes she has to accept Arun for all that, she, that, he, that he is and cannot separate his goodness from his violence, which Arun claims is an expression of the historical injustice and indig indignities perpetrated by upper caste people on Dalits. Arun loves her and regrets beating her, but is still unable to resist. She resents her father by the end of the play by, for raising her with such righteous ideals that are insensitive to the social realities of inequality and structural oppression. Nath is unable to recognize his salutary perception of Arun's poetic sensibilities and his autobiographical novel, which is a sensitive portrayal of his community's collective sufferings and his personal violence. He wishes to understand and embrace Arun through his own paternalistic benevolence, and this comes through in his hypocritical statement during a function where Arun's novel has been awarded the Sahitya Academy, where Nath has been asked to chair the meeting. But Seva is unable to accept Arun for beating Jyoti. She is determined to bring her daughter back, but Jyoti refuses to return as she decides to suffer her marriage to disavow the Gandhian ideals on which she was raised. Arun refuses all responsibility for his behavior and believes it is Jyoti's choice and responsibility to stay in the marriage. By the end, Nath asks his son to reject his own liberal humanism and realizes his own hypocrisy when he is asked to speak about the book and ends up praising it when he doesn't mean it. And we see, we, we saw what actually happens towards the end of the play where the father uh, has to accept the fact that his ideals have not lived up to their own truth and that the daughter in some sense also wants to disavow or uh, get rid of the ideals that she was raised on to embrace her new identity as the wife of an untouchable, as an untouchable herself perhaps. So that's exactly how the play ends. Thank you. Mm -hmm.